Welcome in to our Sunday Bible class today. We're going to be studying uh, about attitude pleasing to God. But before we begin, uh, if you would, get your Bible and get ready to study God's Word. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father in heaven, we come before you thanking you for being our God. We thank you, Father, that you have revealed to us what you would have us to do and how you would have us to be. Help us as we study this to learn of you and learn about you. Apply these things to our lives so that we can draw closer to you more and more each and every day. We pray these few things in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. I've entitled the lesson An Attitude Pleasing to God. And for my text, I chose Galatians 1 and verse 10. The Apostle Paul had just, in the preceding verses, had just told them that you need to stop listening to other accounts that are not the gospel of Christ. And he did that in a very firm tone. And then he says in verse 10, For, now, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. The Apostle Paul knew how important it was to have the right heart set, the right mindset, the right attitude in order to be pleasing to the God of heaven. In Psalms 111 and verse 10, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Sounds very similar to Proverbs 1 7, where the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The psalmist also said in Psalms 119 and verse 7, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. And in Ephesians 5 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul said, For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. When we have in our heart and in our mind to do what is right in the sight of God, we're going to do and try to do all the time what's pleasing to him. So today I want to look at three examples of those who were pleasing to the God of heaven. The first example that I want to look at is, comes to us from Matthew 26, beginning in verse number 6 where the Bible says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, Let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, in this example that I've given here today, we see that that woman's attitude toward Jesus was to be pleasing to him. And it was something that she did out of the kindness of her heart. And at no small expense, it was a great sacrifice that she made here for Jesus Christ. And we can see how wonderful uh, an example this is. But I also chose this example as, as only, only, I'm doing three examples, and this is the only one where there is a poor, a poor attitude along with the good attitude. The woman's attitude toward Christ was one of affection, one of compassion and love. 
and one of sacrifice. It's what we ought to have. That's the attitude we ought to have. But we see the contrasting attitude of John, or rather Judas Iscariot, that John gives us the account of. He being named as the disciple that was complaining to Jesus. Why this waste? When John tells us very much, uh, very clearly tells us, he, had, he didn't care about the waste. He didn't care about the waste or the perfume. He was more concerned about pilfering some of the money. And when we know Judas is, would later betray Jesus with a kiss. And this is, the, this is the same man who was pilfering the money, was a thief among those that Jesus had chosen. And yet Jesus knew this. He knew this, but he also knew how great it was what this woman was doing. And as long as this earth remains, God's word will remain, and this woman will be spoken of. And Jesus had predicted that that would happen, that wherever the gospel was, taught, was preached in the whole world, this woman, what she has done, will be spoken of. And I would suggest to you that it will always be spoken of in a great manner, in a pleasing manner toward God, toward Jesus Christ. That was Mary. Judas' attitude was very poor. And, and he had ulterior motives. If we're not careful, we can also develop a bad attitude. And if we're not careful, we would maybe look at things that we went and not in the way that we should. We may see something going on in the church that is very good and productive, but we only look at the negative aspects of it. And if we're not careful, and we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't criticize the things. We should try and help or make suggestions for betterment instead of saying, well, that's not going to work or this isn't going to work. Instead, come with a suggestion of how it might be improved. But Judas was not, he was not wanting to improve anything except his own pocketbook. That's what he was looking for. The woman will be spoken of forever. It has been recorded forever, the great deed that she did. Second example comes to us from the book of Acts in chapter number 8. A lot of times we look at this and we only talk a lot about the eunuch, and we certainly, we should. But I want you to concentrate on Philip's actions as well as we go through the reading, beginning in verse 26 of Acts, the 8th chapter. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, I've, I've ended the reading here for a reason. It, it's we, if you don't already know, go ahead and read uh, past that once, we, once class is over. Read past that and you see the result of Philip joining the eunuch and being invited to join the eunuch. But I wanted to stop here just to talk a little bit about Philip's attitude toward going to talk to the eunuch. You see, Philip had been preaching in the area of Samaria and many people, great crowds were coming and many people were obeying the gospel. But Philip is told to go talk to this one person. Now, Philip could have said, Lord, what are you talking about? Look at all these people that I'm preaching to. Look at all these, these great crowds that are listening to the gospel message. But Philip didn't say that at all. He went to talk to this one man. There was an occasion several years ago, uh, one of the trips that I've been blessed to take to India, that my uncle and I went to a, a congregation that was out of ways, traveled some great distance to get there. And we got there and, and we got into the building, uh, the, the little more, more or less it was a hut. And we got in and there were four people to listen to us preach the gospel. And neither one of us said anything at the time. We certainly did not want to uh, encroach upon them or, or tell them, you know, uh, tell VJ, you know, why'd we come here for four people? 
But the thought crossed my mind, and afterwards, after it was all over with, and we were on our way back, my uncle and I were discussing this, and he said this the same thought had come to his mind. We drove quite a distance for four people to listen to the gospel. But you know, at the end of, of our, our talk, and when talking to them about the gospel, all four of them stood up to be baptized. You know, many times we may not think of how God operates and, and, and how we are to preach the gospel. We're not told to do it to only great crowds. We're not told, we're not told that we have to have every, such, every convenience whenever we preach the gospel. Philip ran up to this chariot and joined it. Now, of course, we're not told how fast the chariot was going. More than likely, it wasn't going that quickly. But he gets in the chariot. He doesn't question God. And we shouldn't either. When Jesus tells us to go and preach the gospel to all the world, that means everybody. Sometimes that's one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes that's a, a small group of people. Sometimes it's, it's just talking to who, who, whoever will listen. And that's what we ought to do. What a great attitude Philip had. What a great attitude. And I would that my attitude would have been different. I guarantee you the rest of that India trip, it was different. The, apostle, or the, the great evangelist Philip goes and he joins. What a great attitude. And then the eunuch, his attitude. He wanted to know what God wanted him to do. And he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. He was reading God's word. He had just come from worship, worshiping God in Jerusalem. That's where he had gone, what he had gone to do. And now he was continuing to further his knowledge on his own. What a great attitude that is for us as well to learn from. How many times when you go home from worship do you get your Bible out and look over the things that had already been taught in, in, at the service and look at them again and learn from them again? What a great example that is for us. And the eunuch was not so puffed up and so arrogant that he was going to try to figure it out on his own. He asked Philip to help him. If you go on to read, it says that Philip preached Jesus to him. And then the eunuch obeyed the gospel. He obeyed the gospel plan of salvation by being buried in water, rising to walk in newness of life, as we read about in, in Romans 6 and verse 4. What a great thing that Philip had the great attitude of, it doesn't matter, Lord, I'm going to go and preach to him because this is what you've instructed me to do. And what a great attitude that the eunuch had saying, I don't care that I've just spent however much time worshiping God in Jerusalem. I'm on my way back to my hometown, but I'm still going to see what it is that God wanted me to do. He's going to read about what God has written for us. He wanted that knowledge. And that began, as we read a moment ago in Proverbs, with him having a fear of the Lord. We ought to be trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord at all times, not just at our worship service and in our Bible classes, but also on our own, just as the eunuch did. What a great attitude that they had. I'd like to stop before we go to the next point. I want to talk just a little bit about the fact that we have an attitude all the time. Most of the time when we tell someone, I don't like your attitude, it's a negative attitude that we're talking about. Most of the time when we say you have an attitude, it's a negative thing that we are indicating to them. I was talking to a young mother not that long ago, a few months ago, and she, we were talking about this very thing about how young children sometimes have a negative attitude. And she said in her house what they say is you need to change your face. Because let's face it, the way we feel, the way we, we think is usually on our faces. We usually may, we may try to hide it, but it usually, usually comes out on our face. If we're upset or we're aggravated or frustrated about something, and that attitude comes out in the way our face looks. And if we're, we're happy, we understand that. We understand what that looks like. We know what it looks like. And so she tells her children, you need to change your face. And what she means is, change your attitude. Years ago when I used to work in retail, we, we had this idea of when we would hire people, we hire attitude. 
We, we can train them to do the things that they need to do. But if they don't have a good attitude or not able to have a good attitude, the training is not going to be, is not going to mean anything because they're not going to come at it in the right way. It's the same way when we approach God. We can, we can do the things that God asks us to do. We can do those things, but if we don't have the right attitude behind it, the right motivation behind it, then it comes out as very much just lip service or going through the motions. So we need to have the right attitude all the time. Always trying to learn what's pleasing to the Lord. Doing the things that God would have us to do in the way that he would have us to do them. Last example that I want to look at as an attitude that's pleasing to God is from the Apostle Paul. It's his verse that we looked at. of my former manner of life in, in Judaism. How I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, have, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. And he goes on to talk more about the things that he did immediately after his conversion. But I want to stop there and, and just think about this for a moment. How right that he thought he was while he was still known as Saul. Saul. And he was breathing out great threats and he was throwing people in prison because of their faith in Christ. And he thought he was 100% right. His attitude was, I'm being pleasing to God. I'm doing the things that God would have me to do. He was persecuting, killing, putting people in prison all in the name of God and thought he was right. Right. But he would learn that he was not. The way he puts it is, God was pleased to reveal his son in me. You know, when we, as if you, before you became a Christian, if you're a Christian, before you became a Christian, I want you to think back to those days. Now, you may not have thought much about it. You may, may have thought you were right before you became a Christian. I don't know your circumstances before you were a Christian. If you came out of a, a different religious organization and into the Lord's church and was converted to the church, that's what Saul did. He was a Jew. He says, I was advancing beyond many of those who were my con contemporaries. His countrymen. He was very zealous for the traditions. He calls them ancestral traditions. It's an interesting thing that happened to the Apostle Paul. But because of God's grace, because of his willingness to be obedient and choose to believe once it was shown to him the gospel message of Jesus Christ, to believe that. And then Ananias tells him in Acts 22 and 16, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul as he became known, that's what he did. Saul became Paul and did so much good. His attitude changed from one of, I was, thought I was serving God to, I wasn't serving God right, even though I thought I was, and now I'm going to serve him properly. There are many in today's world that are religious, and they are very serious and zealous in their religion. But if they are not worshiping and honoring God according to what is written in the New Testament, according to the gospel message of Jesus Christ, their attitude may be, they may be thinking that they're pleasing to God as Saul thought he was, but they are not. Perhaps someone will teach them the gospel as Ananias taught it to, to Paul and showed him the way to become a Christian. In Acts, the 21st chapter this is the Apostle Paul again. I want you to look at his attitude here. This is much later in his Christian walk after his conversion. 
And the writer Luke brings us this in verse 10. He says, as we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when he had heard this, when we had heard this, rather, we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am, not, I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I've always found it such a, a great thing that this man who was putting people in prison and killing, even killing, being there at Stephen's stoning that we can read about in Acts 7, heartily agreeing with it, holding the coats of the men that were doing the stoning, this man now would die for the one that he wanted to eliminate. The church that he wanted to eliminate, he would now die for. For the Lord Jesus Christ, for his name, Paul was willing to die. You know, I hope that, that none of us ever have to experience that. But we ought to have that same type of faith. Never wanting to renounce Jesus as our Lord and Savior. No matter what. Now that sounds really cavalier and, and brave when people say that. But it shouldn't be just something we say. It should be something that we have thought about, that we've contemplated, and we've made a firm conviction about. The Apostle Paul did. And he did lose his life for the name of the Lord eventually. According to secular history, all the apostles did, save for the Apostle John. And we need to understand how important it is to be faithful. Revelation 2.10 says, for Jesus told that congregation to be faithful until death. And we ought to do that. That means even in the face of death, not just until this life is over. In the previous chapter in Acts, the Apostle Paul is talking to a group of elders from Ephesus. And in verse 18, it says, when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the very first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. The Apostle Paul knew how important it was to continue preaching no matter what it was that would happen to him. There are, there are preachers in the world today that face persecution. Unlike anything that we have seen in our particular country here in the USA, but they are facing persecutions that is very real. It is, it is not something that is made up. It is not just some story. It is, not, it is a factual account, just as what happened to the Apostle Paul is a factual account. It's happening in our world today. We ought to be praying for them. We ought to be praying for them that they would maintain an attitude pleasing to God, no matter what it is that they're going through. And we ought to, have that, again, have that same attitude as the Apostle Paul. He wanted to serve the Lord. This particular verse, verse 19, he wanted to serve, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, with trials, which came upon him from among his own countrymen who were not willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be pleasing to God. But he says, I did not shrink from declaring to you 
anything that was profitable, anything that was good for you to know about Jesus Christ, about God, Paul was willing to share that. What a great attitude that is pleasing to God, the Apostle Paul. It's one that you can study over and over and over and get more and more out of, of how much he truly cared for the Lord Jesus Christ, how much he truly loved him. You may recall from 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul's life is about to end. He maintained that positive attitude toward Jesus Christ. And it was something that he knew that Timothy would need to hear. And we would need to hear. He says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Having an attitude that's pleasing to God is not something that you ever reach the pinnacle of. It's something that we must continually work on every single day. Because we are human, and we, we have different things that are going on in our lives all the time. We may have a day where we feel like our attitude is not what it ought to be. But we should remember and go back to God's word and look at those people. They're such great examples of having a pleasing attitude toward God. We could go on and on about the many examples of those who were pleasing toward God. They made mistakes. They did things that were wrong. But their overall attitude, what was in their heart, was to do what God said. And do it in the right way. We ought to have that same attitude. We ought to be willing to do whatever it is that God asks for us to do. And do it with joy in our hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you once again thanking you for being our God. We thank you, Father, for the good examples that we have of people that were pleasing toward you in your holy word. Help us, Father, on those days when our attitude is less than what we would like it for it to be. And help us to change our face. Help us to be better. Help us to have the right attitude that is pleasing to you. Thank you so much for the examples that you have in your holy word for us. Help us, Father, to continually look to those examples, continually read your word and study it to know what you would have us to do, and then to go about doing those very things. Forgive us when we fail you, Father. And help us always return, repent, and return to you. Pray these few things in Jesus' name.